my friends would make fun of me because the specials were not a cool group like the Amazing Trio or the Crusaders. But you know, screw that. I also liked Winger better than Bon Jovi. I still do. I don't care what the critics say. <laughs> Guess what? I got a fever. And the only prescription is more. Yeah! Kip Winger. 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 Hey, Mr. Kip Winger, everybody, please. What's up? Yeah. 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 Well, Appreciate you being here, buddy. Hi, everybody. How are you today? This is Mark Chapardini. Thank you so much for coming back to the Go See Talk podcast experience. We are thrilled and delighted and super excited to bring our next guest on the show today. But before we get to that, we'd like to say hello and thanks to our co-host, Matt Jacobs. Matt, how are you doing today? Hey, Mark. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me here. And Kip, thanks a lot for being here. Yeah, thank you guys for having me. No problem. Well, um, since he's on the screen, it's probably no mystery, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, At this point, the 80s seemed miles away, but the sound was incredible. It was so good, it can pull you under, and all these years later, we can't get enough. We're still hungry. So come a little closer as we invite our guest, an out-of-the-world singer, composer, bass man, proud desperado, songsmith, rock wizard who keeps us hanging on. Now, who's the one I'm talking about? Well, if Huey Lewis is the sound of the working man, then Winger is the sound of that working man at happy hour after a few pints, hiding, riding high on life, loving life, looking for better days coming and everything that comes down the pike. So please help us welcome the man whose personality and band are the spell I'm under. I'm talking about the one, the only, the immortal Kip Winger. Kip, how are things in your world? Things are great, man. That was that was a hell of an introduction. Thank you for naming all those song titles. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah, things are great, man. I'm here in uh, as playing Dallas tonight, and uh, think, uh, all original members of my band, and uh, working on uh, a violin concerto that I have for Nashville Symphony coming due uh, in my hotel room. So double duty on my double life. Well, excellent, excellent, and that that's what we're excited to hear about. It's um, Rick Beato called it a pivot. Some people have a transition. Some people just want something different, whether it's hamburgers or ice cream. And the things that you've done have captured our imaginations. You're in our DNA. I mean, we've got we've got winger on cassette. We've got winger on vinyl. We've got winger on our phones. It's like it's in our DNA and it's here to stay. So anything you want to talk about, this is your your landmark, your launch pad, whatever. But why don't we start with a fun grapefruit question? Um, Because, you know, grapefruits are... I think you like preference, <laughs> don't don't you? <laughs> Man, you get you really did your homework. <laughs> well, let's talk about this. Um, let's see, I got quite a list. So, do you consider yourself a musician or an entertainer? And I ask that because whether you have a band or whether you're a solo artist uh, focusing on classical compositions, does it change for you? Do you always have one sort of line in the sand? How, how do you how do you view yourself? That's an awesome question. I say I, I always say that I offer that analogy a lot on my own in interviews um, unsolicited. Um, I consider myself an artist first and foremost and not an entertainer, although obviously I was very focused on the entertainment element of it for many, many years, less so now other than presenting my band in in the way that you would expect to but i shy away from the entertainer aspect of it more and more as i kind of move through my life's journey and so much so that when i work when i unless i'm composing classical music now i feel like it's physically painful you know like i i winger just put out a record last may and it was a two-year process through COVID, a very difficult record to make. And I i never said this in an interview before, but I kind of experienced it as physical pain. You know, I mean, I knew I knew I was tasked to do a winger record. I knew I wanted it to be among our best, which is never easy. But I also am so, um, nowadays, I'm so pulled towards writing orchestral music that 
working on anything else feels kind of painful to me, which is a strange thing to say, but my, uh, on, a, on a soul and spiritual level, I'm just pulled in that direction. Um, and I hear so much music in that direction that um, I'm really worried that it, I won't get it all done. So I'm really focused on trying to open up enough space and time in my life just to devote to that. Well, talking about the pain, I'm curious if if making a record that was not your your prime direction, uh, how how does the music videos come into that? Could you have just said, "Hey, we did an album, that's enough," but like, what was the impetus to say we really got to drive this home and do the you know do the videos feel like they're a, a stretch for you? Yes and no. I mean, they, it comes very naturally to do videos, um, and I've done them my whole career. Uh, I think they're more important now than ever because nowadays with music comes a visual component. I mean, with with social media, I mean, it's you have to think it, from that point of view, regardless. And and it, it's it's in my contract. It's in my record contract that you have to deliver videos. You know, so um, at this point in my career it's a little bit like who do i want to be on video and we're not a band that has a huge budget so it's kind of like all right what do we do on a smaller budget and where it's gonna where it's gonna really work and sometimes you do it sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't i mean you don't have you you, you shoot a video and you're hoping you got the shots and sometimes like i actually have two or three videos to this album the winger seven in the can that i don't actually want to release because we kind of missed the mark you know Mm -hmm. um having said that i think tears of blood was really accidentally uh a really good video because we filmed that you know you i'm totally slow motion in the whole video and that was an afterthought it was like hey let's do this double time and i'll just sing it's very difficult to do it because you're singing twice as fast they slow the and then they play the 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 film back at at normal speed and it shows you in slow motion but you're singing along with the words Mm -hmm. and it turned out to be a really cool effect and i think that video is very effective but you know sometimes you miss the mark well that that's fair uh and maybe unfortunate but uh with more than five decades of experience is there something that you look back and you go there's no way I could do that now. Or conversely, is there something that you, you know, song that you did now, maybe like stick the knife in and twist, you know, you wish you would have done that earlier in your career? Interesting to say that I, the second album was a, was tough for me because I wanted to remix that album. And I felt like it could have been better in many ways and i didn't get a chance to do it because the machine was just rolling on to like a tsunami which i didn't at the time i didn't realize that i actually had the power to just put on the brakes because i was there were so many uh moving parts that i just kind of got carried away in it but had i if i look back at it i would have absolutely said stop let's go back in and you know fix several things on this album including a few more songs but Um, as far as works that I've done now, the only thing I could say is that, you know, from a image point of view, we were totally, um, ignorant. You know, I was like, Reb and I were writing the first record looking at MTV and it was, you know, White Snake and Cinderella and all these kind of bands. We were like, I don't know, what do you want to wear? You know, I was coming out of Alice Cooper where it was like, kind of a glass of blood a day, you know, um, just like the the creepy thing. And, and we were just kind of going, what should we wear, you know? So we just kind of followed along. And, and, the, and the better way to do that would have just been jeans and a T-shirt, you know. But we got carried away in the, in the, in the era, and it was fun, and we were successful. So I don't have really any regrets. I can just see that there was a, you know, when the 80s thing got taken over by grunge, there was a reason for that. You know, it was very saturated market and people were tired of it. And the younger generation wanted their own um, style of music to call their own. And, you know, we kind of got uh, we were we we came a little too late. And so we were on the wrong side of that. That's the but as far as songs that I would put out earlier than later, not not really, because getting back to this artistic 
artistic point of view, you know, and any artist would tell you this, I would, I would wager to say any artist would tell you this, when you're working on a piece of art, whether it be a painting or a sculpture or a clay pot or a song or a symphony or whatever, I mean, that stuff comes into you in that point in time, you know, and that's when it comes. You, I've never been successful like, oh, I wrote a song 10 years ago. Let's re-resurrect it and, and do it now because it's 10 years ago energy. It doesn't, it doesn't work, really, um, unless you're really trying to contrive a hit or something like that. But if you're just doing um, something that you want to sound inevitable, it's always something that's happening like right now. And if you can grab the inspiration that's hitting you from the universe and manifest it in the moment, that will always be the best path. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that because um, I, this weekend I learned a, a word called metamorphothea. It's a Greek word that means um, becoming who you are. So it's not, say, a future tense thing. It's like it's it's happening real time. So I, I like that that's... Um, it has, there's a parallel to what you're you're saying that uh, it wasn't um, it's different from fate so to speak. So on that note, have have you had that experience your whole life? I've been lucky to be inspired daily, and so because of that, I've had to find I've had to find a way to hone whatever skills it took to manifest those inspirations. I mean, that's what I would say. And I've always, I've always tried to be very aware and very um, in service to that, you know, it's, that's always been at the top of my priority list in terms of um, being true to true, true to myself as far as my inspirations go and and be very honest about them and, and know where I sit in the latitude um, and never have uh, an overblown opinion of any of my work or anything like that. You know, um, I don't know if I'm answering your question, I'm kind of rambling at this point, but. Um, no, I, I think you did. And that, that kind of, you know, as a consumer, we make connections that may not be there, but uh, one connection, especially looking from conversations with Nijinsky, to something like 2009's Karma album, there's a, um, a song called First Ending, which is, I would call it like a cowboy precursor to Nijinsky because it feels like a classical orchestration and then kind of times out with some steel guitar. And I'm wondering, did that open the door for you in any way that to finally say, this is, you know, this is now, I'm living in the moment, but the moment's taken me this way. I'm gonna burst your bubble so hard right now, man. <laughs> Rod Morgenstein wrote that. Okay. Wow. That's that's Rod Morgenstein playing piano. <laughs> and it's his composition dedicated to his late wife Michelle. And I was like, "Come on, Rod, let's stick something that you wrote on here. Let's just tack it on to the end of this album." And so that's where that came from. But um if you want to follow the lineage of my journey, you can go all the way back to Hungary, where there's a string quartet on the beginning of that song. And um, from a very early age, I was drawn to music that I heard to have more substance in terms of music theory and composition. I grew up in a band with my two older brothers and another kid from the neighborhood named Peter Fletcher. So it was me, my brother Nate, my brother Paul, and Peter Fletcher. And we we started very early. I was playing, uh, when I was eight years old, we were doing gigs for money, you know. So, and I started listening to, I started here. I heard my, my mind was blown when I heard Freehand by Gentle Giant, you know, and Yes and Jethro Tull and all this kind of music that had just a little bit more, you know. And so I studied classical guitar at 16 at the University of Denver uh, privately with a guy named Samuel Guarnaccia, who was a great music teacher. And I rarely mention his name because I always skip to when I started really studying composition. But that was really when I developed an ear for Baroque music and, and started on the path to something more, you know.
Okay. Well, then this question is probably going to be a uh, similarly <laughs> shot down. Um, <laughs> you played with Alan Parsons for a little over a year. Uh, he's got a, a number of instrumentals on the Pyramid album. There's In the Lap of the Gods. Did you talk about any of those shared experiences with uh, instrumentals and classical compositions? And again, I'm, I'm making superficial consumer I love connections. It. No, it's you know it's really fascinating for me to hear the 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 dots that get connected. Um, some of them, a lot of them are you know right. Some of them are completely off. But no, I I Alan and I did. I didn't know Alan. I did a I did a benefit for Jim Peterick in I think two thousand two or two thousand three, where I did you know I've been doing this solo acoustic thing for a long time. Um, so I played my solo acoustic set. Um, and Alan was on the bill and I met Alan at that thing. Of course, I was a huge Alan Parsons fan. He influenced all of us. And, uh, he was very nice. I mean, super lovable, very intelligent, uh, just a beautiful human. I mean, you know, I can't say enough about great things about Alan Parsons. Um, but I met him briefly and we, t that was it. And then I got a call when I was, when I landed at the LA airport. Hello, Kip, it's Alan Parsons. I'd like you to be my lead singer. I was like, completely like, that was one of those moments, you know, it was just like, uh, I couldn't believe it. I was just like, okay, well, just text me where you want me to be and I'll, I'll absolutely be there, you know. So I, that was a great experience. Although, as a lead singer without a bass, it was a little weird. I'd never done that role because I, Lead the breed of lead singer humans is definitely different than the than the lead singers that play bass or guitar. You know, like I'm in the Sting, McCartney, Getty Lee, Peter Cetera. That's the group of men, the people that I. Now I'm not talking about talent level. I'm just saying that like I'm in that mentality. Lead singer people are different. You know, um, and so I was like a lead singer that didn't play an instrument in his band, and it was strange. I mean, it's great because you can focus solely on the vocals, but, um, and it was a fantastic opportunity and I really love them. They're great people. Um, but my schedule just became too difficult to manage all of it. And I, I had to let that gig go. Although we've worked together since I, I wrote, um, some orchestral arrangements for him when he produced Jake Shima Bakuru. And, you know, we get together for dinner when he's in town or if I, you know, we're good. I'd say we're pretty good friends. Great. Amazing human being. Talent tends to come together like that. So <laughs> excellent. Excellent. I mean, you know, he's just, I mean, come on. He's, he's royal. He's blue blood, you know, uh, top of the tier. Uh... Yeah. So Kip, you, you talked to, you mentioned a couple of uh, front men that are also, outstanding instrumentalists and mark and i were talking a couple days ago and we were thinking about you know how many rock musicians have had success in the rock music world and then they've made a successful transition into the world of classical composition in, in some shape or form right and so we were kind of batting that around trying to prepare for the interview and uh, one guy that came to mind and it's a pretty short list i think maybe uh maybe rick wakeman uh i think would kind of fit in that mold uh you know, Ingve did a, a concerto years ago, where of course you know the guitar obviously was the focal instrument, uh, but that was a classical piece. And so, really, I guess to say that this is a pretty unusual story um, for someone to be so successful in the rock world, and then to rededicate themselves to learn how to be a classical composer. And so we we were thinking, kind of, you know, the origin story as you've told this in the past was that uh, you had exposure to ballet, and you kind of fell in love with not only the movement, but especially the music when you were exposed to that. And then, you know, you went off and you did the rock thing for over a decade uh, with Alice Cooper, with with Winger. And I guess the question we were curious about is, did you always have this goal in mind uh, to come back at some point and compose classical music? Or did that opportunity come about more unexpectedly? No, it, it, from very early on, I was like, I'm going to, finish my last chapter writing classical music. There's actually footage of me that I've been searching for forever. 
in an interview in like 1990 when we were at our peak and I was saying, I'm going to be doing classical music by the time I'm this old. I can't remember what I said. Um, I've always known it. I've always been trying to prepare for it. The, the, the difference is for me was that I was afraid that I wouldn't, I, w- I just wanted to do it for the love of it. And I was, I didn't imagine I would get all these performances that I've managed to get. Um, it was just something that moved me at such a core level. And I knew that actually it was my destiny, always known that since I was 16 years old. Um, and so I, I actually, I, I wouldn't say I have a regret, but I kind of have some regrets that I didn't get started earlier um, studying on a really intense level earlier. But I mean, I was quite honestly, I was afraid. I mean, I was like, man, you know, that's just like, whoa, I revered it to a point. You know, when you, anybody that, when you think about a thing that you'd like to do and you fantasize about something that you want to do and it's got this magical thing to it, you, and then you start studying it and figuring it out and, and you demystify this thing, you know, when you dig down into it. And so that can have a negative effect on things, you know what I mean? Like, oh, like I can't listen to music so easily anymore. When I was young, it was like I was just like a sponge listening to all the classical I could get and ooh, listen to that and that's so cool and what is he doing there? And now... It's really like, okay, I know what he's doing there. You know, it's a whole different experience, you know. So now it's, it's the, the objective is to chase the sound that I'm hearing that I haven't been able to find. Um, I know I'm getting off, off, off point here, but uh, to go back to your point, I always knew that this was going to be my destiny. I didn't have a goal of like, I'm going to get all these orchestras to play my stuff. I just wanted to ha- grow the skills to be able to write uh, organically for the orchestra um, and be able to really speak in that language no bullshit like walk in and know how to communicate to them on their terms that was that was really you know my goal now there are a few guys that have crossed this barrier Johnny Greenwood from Radiohead he's a pretty literate composer um, Steve Vai is a very literate composer um, uh, Stuart Copeland to a, wrote some operas and stuff like that. Um, um, I'm, uh, who's the guy in Pink Floyd that's done some opera writing? Um, not Gilmore. Who's the other guy? Uh, Waters. Yeah, Roger Waters. Yeah. I don't know his skill level. See, and to me, I'm really a purist about this. I feel like if you're composing classical music, well, I should say orchestral music, because when you talk about our classical music, classical in its purest definition is a period of time in orchestral music. But anyway, um, you should be able to articulate every single thing for every instrument and you should orchestrate it all yourself and, you know, really just take the journey by yourself and deliver the orchest- the score to the orchestra without the orchestrator coming in and, you know, all that kind of a, you know, uh help you know i think it's really incumbent on somebody who really wants to consider themselves a composer of orchestral music to to have all those skills themselves so i kind of went overboard in that department danny elfman is another one who kind of Mm -hmm. crossed from oingo boingo um and you know so there are those guys i don't know any of them that actually got a grammy nomination for contemporary classical composition and for that i'm very proud of that but um anyway i'm i hope i'm answering your questions no you did kip and i I think touching on uh the grammy and hearing for the first time hearing conversations with Najinsky played live so a composition that you've spent so much time working on you've spent so much time developing the skill to be able to get to that point what did that feel like to finally be able to see that performed and then get get the recognition uh, with the Grammy nomination that, you know, you had achieved something that you'd been trying to do for a long time. The most satisfying 
experience of my entire life. I mean, w w hands down. Even before that, when I wrote Ghosts and San Francisco Ballet, Chris Wielden, um, who's now a super well-known choreographer and Tony award-winning choreographer for, he did MJ and, you know, he's, he's very, very successful guy. But back when he did Ghosts, he was still like an up and comer. And, you know, there I am sitting in the San Francisco Opera House watching San Francisco Ballet dance to my music. I mean, that was always what, it, when I, what it, my biggest goal when I did ballet, I was hearing this music. I wanted to write for dancers, you know. And so that was huge. And, you know, what was amazing about that piece is that it's been performed at Lincoln Center, Chate, the Theater Chateau in Paris, Hong Kong, Germany, um, you know, several you know, at San Francisco, you know, all over the world, and uh, LA Ballet. I mean, Austin Ballet. I mean, a lot of people have done that piece, and it's it's surreal. <clears throat> and so, what happened was the conductor at San Francisco Ballet, a fellow by the name of Martin West, who's a really great at interpreting my music um suggested we make an album i conversations with dijinsky was intended to be a ballet for chris and i finished it and when he heard it um he was like man i don't really see anything for this uh i'm gonna have to take a pass which was disappointing for me on one hand but on another hand martin west was like let's make an album so I independently raised some money on a, on a Kickstarter and, and got some independent help to raise money to make an album with San Francisco Ballet. And we, we recorded Ghosts, Conversations with Nijinsky, and one other piece called A Parting Grace. And uh, that was the album that we submitted for the, for the Grammy. Um, and I mean, I just was like, I don't have a shot in hell, but I mean, you know, there I was in the top five of uh, getting a nomination. It was totally surreal. So then, Kip, looking forward, you, you've got uh, a violin concerto that you've been commissioned uh, that I think is, if I have my info right, spring of 2025, roughly. Is that when yeah. that work would be delivered? Yeah, yeah. May 9 and 10 of, of 2025. That, um, Nashville Symphony performed Conversations with Dijinsky and Giancarlo Guerrero, who's now become a good friend of mine, um, <laughs> when they played it, oh my God, it was like, because it's a bigger, San Francisco Ballet Orchestra doesn't have as many musicians. And when I heard it with Nashville Symphony, it was just a bigger sound because they literally had more musicians. And he did a fantastic job with it. And... Uh, it really went over well and the and the ceo of the nashville symphony alan valentine was pulled me aside that night it was like i want to make an album of your music you know so they commissioned me for two works a, a symphony and a violin concerto and i was sitting at lunch with Giancarlo. he's like so come on kip what do you want to write for this commission you want to do your do your symphony number one and i was like I hadn't even thought of that. Like, okay, you know, when you write, I'm a fan of John Adams, the uh, of, among many other composers, but, you know, John Adams, a very famous class, probably the most famous orchestral composer of American, other than John Corleano. Um, you know, he, he gives his, his compositions really cool titles and stuff, and nobody's doing like a symphony, you know, and... And Giancarlo suggests that to me, and I was just, my mind kind of went blank. I was like, oh, my God, could I write, you know, you know, you think of all the symphonies that have come before you, you know, and you're just, it's very, very intimidating. Um, and so I percolated on that for a while and, and finally wrote what became my symphony number one, and they performed it in March of 22, recorded it, and now we're recording the violin concerto in may of 25. so kip can you give us a little bit of a preview in terms of what that what what the violin concerto sort of where it is in the developmental stage and kind of 
what it will potentially sound like in terms of theme, theme and mood, and then maybe where it's going to be performed. Um, so the, the, the first, the concert master, the new concert master for, um, Nashville symphony is a great violinist named Peter Otto. And he will be performing it. Um, it's in four movements and it's, you know, it's like a fast movement, a kind of dance scherzo style, almost like a tango, but not. Um, and then an adagio that's perhaps the best melody I've ever written. Um, not because it's my latest, just because it, I wrote for the third movement, I wrote this melody in 2018 and I knew the melody was better than I was. And I was thinking, oh my God, how could I, you know, bring this melody to fruition without sounding cheesy? And it took me years to figure that out. And, I'm, and I always reference other people's music to find out, okay, what did he do in this? And there's a great composer who was a friend of mine, rest his soul, he passed away a couple of years ago, named Christopher Rouse. And, and I lifted something out of his violin concerto was like the exact component I needed to make this melody work. Um, and then the last movement's kind of a finale feeling movement. Um, so it's, um, man, I could play you some of it, but um, it's all on MIDI. Um, you know, uh, I'm not sure I can find it right now. Let's see here. The the um, the fourth movement has this kind of. So I dreamt this melody. Pop 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 da 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 That's the theme. So I and it goes on from there. Um, um, and there's some huge growth moments in that mo movement for me. There's one section in there where I needed to go bigger. And it was a bit of a spinal tap moment for me because I was like, you know, how much more big could you be? And the answer is none. And uh, Finally, I was like, oh, my God, Goretzky's Third Symphony, movement number one. Now, for anybody who's never heard that symphony, please go listen to it. It's 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 incredible. And it was and the album when it came out actually sold a million copies. And and I studied what he did in the crescendo of that piece. And it kind of made my head explode. And I kind of use that in, in the end of that piece. Um, uh, the set, the scherzo movement it has a very playful melody, but -da 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 -da, it's kind of a chromatic thing. Kind of that vibe, and uh, that sounds fantastic, Kip. Is this the first, uh, the the premiere in some ways of any of this being shared publicly, or because I, I certainly have not uh, have not yeah. heard. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, I've never played it. I mean, I don't play this stuff for many people. Um, so yeah, there's a little, look, a couple little bitty bit, bits of preview, but um, I'm I'm finishing it now, and I'm just about to get it into. I'm in the engraving process to make the score look cool and all that. 
So, so Kip, I guess this is a, a composition or songwriting question, and you kind of alluded to sometimes you hit a point with a composition or a song where you kind of don't know where to go. You hit a roadblock of some kind. And I've heard you talk previously about uh, studying under Michael Curick, uh, Richard Daniel Poor, I think, and kind of those being people, I think maybe the, the latter more than the former that you would maybe sometimes go to if you hit a point uh, where you're trying to develop some new material um, and you're not quite sure, you know, where a particular movement would go. And I guess that could be the same for, for rock music. You could have a, a rock song where you get kind of stuck on a certain spot. And you're not sure where to, where to mature that, that song to. So I guess the question is, you know, have you had, have you experienced different points in your career where uh, you've had difficulty developing I ideas for new material? And then how do you get past that roadblock and inspire creativity so you can, you can finish the song or the composition? Well, there's three components to that answer. Number one is continually hone your skills. So when you, when you get hit by the inspiration, you have more tools by which to deal with those inspirations because as time goes on, they become more and more complex. You know, number two is always have a mentor that's better than you. I mean, I've, I've, I've been big on mentors my whole life. My dad gave me uh, the book Think and Grow Rich when I was like 16, you know, that Napoleon Hill, like the, 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 the archetype to, you know, how to achieve what you want to achieve in life. Um, and it's, and it's really, it talks about shadowing, you know, if you want to be a successful corporate executive, sh go shadow uh, the big corporate executive and, and, and learn the tools of the trade from them directly, you know. And so I always have tried to do that in music and always, you know, from my first 16 year old teacher, Sam Guaranacha and on forward. And yeah, the latest is Daniel Poor and Curic. I, I, I ask them both questions from, you know, equally so, so much because um, be, they're, they're, they respond in different ways. So I'll know who would be the best to answer a certain question. And, they're both way more experienced than I am. So, you know, that's um, important. And um, as far as to your road, the roadblock question, um, if, for example, in a classical piece of music, if I'm really stuck, and this was a piece of advice that Curate gave me, was just start singing. Hmm. Just sing your way out of it. And I also applied that to rock music um, because what a lot of musicians, especially rock musicians, probably don't, they haven't come to realize that getting away from your instrument is really where it's at, you know. Um, it's cool to sit down and play something, but you get locked in and lost in the sound of the actual instrument. Or if you sit down at the piano and you start working with an idea and then it's like, ooh, this sounds so great, I'm just going to sit here and jam. And it's really best, and the way I more and more the way I compose is like, okay, I'm hearing something, I kind of work it out, and then I walk away. Um, and, and just try to listen to the shape of what I'm hearing, and see if it's possible to find that shape, you know, with which instruments, you know, and you can do a lot of this just in your in your mind. I mean, in your what I would say is in your mind and in your soul, you know, summoning, um, the music coming down from the universe because there is a part of me i don't know i'm somewhat of a mystic in this way and i but i'm also a skept i would call myself a skeptical mystic um it's romantic to think oh the music already out there written and all you have to do is grab it but there is some truth to that you know um, and so if you can tap a vein in the universe and find an opening to bring this down and know what to do with it when you get there. Um, so it's honing your skills and it's, it's like going to the gym, you know, you have to, if you wanna lift a, a, a heavier weight, you have to be doing this consistently or, or else when you lift that heavy weight, you're gonna pull a muscle. Um, it's the same with music or art of any kind and to be ready for the inspiration when it hits you and to be fast and stuff to now this is different you know with film composers they work so much faster i take a really long time to do this stuff because for me 
that's just my process. And I actually tried film music a little bit, but it's, it brings the worst out in me. So I'm kind of resigned to the fact that I'm just kind of one of these art, art, you know, these art people that, you know, just does what I do. But um, that's it, you know, hone your skills so you're ready to, to uh, grab the inspiration. Always have a mentor on hand to give you an idea of where to go. Mirror another composer, like even songwriting, like what would Sting do? What would Peter Gabriel do? What would, you know, Bono do? Or what would Alice Cooper do or whatever? You know, those kind of ways are all ways to break yourself out of a, uh, you know, um, blank spot. And there are many of them. Yeah, so Kip, that brings it question to mine uh, related to seven um i know noticed on proud desperado that uh that was co-written with desmond child i think is that correct yeah well that with code with proud desperado um we had all the music and all the melody and i was like i can't write these words mm-hmm. i just couldn't come up with anything cool i had uh i had the word desperado i was like I was singing, hey, Desperado, blah, blah, you know, whatever, just any old thing. And I just couldn't come up with anything. And I thought, fuck, I need some help on this. And I've known Desmond forever. And uh, he was in town doing a songwriter workshop with, with my buddy David Fishoff, who does rock and roll fantasy camp. And so they were in town. I was like, yeah, I'm going to come over and check it out because I'm always interested in what Desmond would say. And I just said, hey, man, I got a song I need help on. Would you help me out? He's like, absolutely. You know, I didn't I figured he was way too busy working with, you know, songwriter to the stars. I mean, come on. And he was I mean, that experience was genius because he is he can he can usurp the meaning of a song just by the way that the, the music feels. You know, he was like, well, this feels like this and you're singing those words and this is what this song is about. So let's what about this? And he gives me three lines and my head explodes. And um, that was incredible. I mean, hit me. Desmond is got the goods, man. I mean, it's really incredible. Um, So that was great. And, you know, before and another guy that I've worked with when I was lyrically blocked was uh, donnie purnell from that band kicks oh yeah yeah he wrote wrote the words to deal with the devil on karma and i mean those are some of the best words on any of my albums he wrote um he co-wrote the lyrics on tin soldier midnight driver of a love machine i mean he's really really good and i've been hit and miss on lyrics like some lyrics i write i think they're terrible some of them like tears of blood i think is a really good lyric that i wrote but some of them some i you know a lot of them i'll i'll write and i'll I'll, i won't dig them so i'll try to get help yeah you know i did not know that about uh donnie purnell so i I grew up in the the baltimore area so a maryland guy and kicks of course is like one of the maryland rock bands you know so um i've seen you know i've seen them live and um that's that's pretty awesome but i did not know that uh that fact about him co-writing Kicks, um, Midnight Dynamite. That I had a song on Midnight Dynamite. It was the first published song I ever had. The Bang Bang Balls of Fire. I wrote the music to that, and they were like, and I had a you know a crappy lyric, and they were like, hey, we love the music on this. Can we can we take the music and do our thing with it? And I was absolutely. So that was that was my first published song. Huh. Wow. Okay. That's yeah. I did I, not. I did not know that. That's uh. Yeah. One of one of the, the great rock bands. Uh, always one of my favorite bands. Yeah. Um, Steve Steve Whiteman, Blue Blood American, best frontman of anybody out there, man. Yeah, I could tell you. I saw them about. They just hung it up pretty recently, but I saw them a couple years ago in Dallas, and uh, they were still killing it. They sounded great. Steve sounded great. Yeah. Um. So it's yeah. It's a shame that they're not not touring anymore but i think they went out on a high note they did and i'm feeling the same way I, i'm i'm finding more and more that i i'm i'm i don't want to perform much anymore i want to f- devote my life to um becoming a better composer and studying music more and understanding about orchestral writing and uh 
the travel's killing me and I don't love it. I love being on stage and performing, especially for fans that appreciate it. But I'm, I'm with Steve, man. I'm like, I'm getting close to the end. I think, um, you know, you, we had a little conversation via email trying to set up this interview. And I think you said something to the effect of, um, appreciate that you love seven, but this is probably going to be the last of its kind. And so, you know, not sure if uh, fans are ready to hear that, but if it, as, as an artist, you need to follow your heart. And it's something that you've been, like you said, you wanted to be a classical composer long ago. So this should be no surprise to anybody, but I love, uh, first of all, I appreciate you giving such a, a glimpse into what your concerto is going to be. And um, just even in MIDI, it sounded phenomenal. Um, I have to ask a question about A Parting Grace. Um, who was the violinist on that? Oh, Mo, you got, you got me on there. You'd have to look at the credits on the album. She was a, um, it was a woman that was being kind of auditioned for the concertmaster position. So we were lucky because she came in to work with the orchestra right at the time we were doing the the um, the recording, and I don't know if she ended up staying with them or not. But the credit's got to be on the album, and I'm glad you noticed that piece. I really love that piece. It kind of it largely went unnoticed, um, but um, I think it's a I think all in all it it's a good. It's a, I think it's a good piece. I mean, it never, nobody, not many people, you know, ended up noticing it, but I'm, I thank you for mentioning it. Well, I mean, it is tremendous. I mean, just because of its, its brevity compared to ghosts and uh, conversations in that, that total album, but there's something about it that, it, and I got to go right to my notes. It feels like when you make your compositions, you're telling a story. That's the way you elicit the emotions and, and, and really bring the audience in. But I feel that if you could give it like an elevator pitch, it's happy to have spent the time with you, but so sad to leave this world. It just feels like a, a prolonged sadness, but not a dour down. And I think the violin does, you know, it does the heavy lifting on that. So. You're very close. The, the, actual, the actual statement of that piece is through deep reverence and respect for each other, two lovers converse about the pain of their inevitable separation. Avocado, avocado, but I love the way you said it better. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you, you, you hit the nail on the head. So that's nice that I was able to portray that. And, uh, you know, again, we make connections that probably don't exist, but sometimes when it speaks to you, it just uh, hits you. So I love it. I mean, I you know, I, I should go on social media more and answer people's questions. I've been, I've been meaning to do that on the Rick Beato interview because a lot of people said a lot of things and had a lot of great comments that I just haven't had time to go answer. And now I feel a little foolish to go on three months later, you know, yeah. And, um, but uh, I really love all of that and the, and the way people connect the dots that I would have never even thought of. And that I think is the essence, the true essence of art. I mean, um, it's really in the eye of the beholder, the end. I mean, I'm, I say I, we as artists, I am always trying to include myself in, a, in the group consciousness of artists because I don't feel I'm anything special um, in terms of I'm another guy trying to be a creator, you know, in that way. But it's our meaning of something. It's only for us. I mean, it's it's really for everybody else to kind of, you know, have it have it be what it is for them. And that's the glory of it. You know, I've had a lot of people listen to certain songs going, this is what this song meant to me and it saved my life. And it had nothing to do with, I, with what I was saying, you know. Well, I want to draw a parallel, <clears throat> a personal parallel, maybe. I love when music goes in unexpected turns and, and routes. And in that respect, I, I've always been a fan of Down Incognito because it starts kind of grungy and it's kind of gritty. And then it becomes sort of fun um, in sort of the second act. And, that, you know, the, the fourth movement of Nijinsky, you have a track called La Immortal, um, where it's almost like, it's very Copeland-esque, it's grand, but then it becomes sort of adventurous. It's like Indiana Jones meets Tex Avery. So that's another sort of alternate take that, you know, it, it keeps you guessing and it's exciting. So um, I just love that you're able to do that both in the rock world and the compositional world. 
No, thank you. I, I was hanging on for dear life on that fourth movement. I was like, oh, my God, what do I do now? And I'd be waiting, waiting like, a, God, what do I do? And then and I kept trying. You know, I, I'm a for anybody who listens to my classical music and there's not a lot of it. I'm really this is why I want to I want to spend more time so I can really build a, a, a big body of work. But um, early on when I I I took some music lessons from a fellow by the name of Edgar Grana in New York, private composition lessons. And he had me an, a, do an analysis of Elgar's Enigma variations. And for anybody that knows that piece, it's, it's theme and variations. I don't, can't remember how many movements there are, but he takes a very small musical cell and does theme and variations that are absolutely genius. It's in my opinion, the best, uh, example of theme and variations out there and it had a humongous influence on me um, so when I come up with a musical theme I kind of take the theme and variation approach within every movement of what I do like the second movement of the violin concerto the da 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 and I'm going da 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 and I'll just take that as far as I can go you know and you'll hear that a lot in my music and I do that in songwriting too you know, um, but all but with what you were saying earlier about, you know, throwing in surprises, you know, for example, in the middle section of it all comes back around. I mean, I'll just take something and completely turn it on its head because I I don't dig songs that kind of you know, they, they take you on a little journey and then they never go anywhere, you know, I mean, some, sometimes that can be cool as a, as a, as a technique, but, you know, I was always a fan of the Beatles where they'd take the middle eight somewhere totally different, you know. You've been playing a lot of 12 string, uh, which brings a more robust sound, especially when you have to be a one man band. Um, and it reminds me of, of, of players like Joe Pass or John Butler or maybe even Michael Hedges for the, for the fact that they present themselves a lot grander. Um, so by being able to take your music and sort of churn it and let it patine over time, um, how, how did those two things come together? Completely by economic purposes. I mean, when I was, when, when the grunge thing hit, I was completely out of a gig. So the... Uh, I started getting, I started doing gigs as solo acoustic because, you know, that was really the, all I could get. And uh, 12 string just sounded bigger. And I started working out how to play all these songs on 12 string. And I play, I studied classical guitar, so I would finger pick them and it would have a little bit of a different vibe to it. You know, things like Spell I'm Under or Free or uh cross or songs like this where i'm finger picking a 12 string and it really just evolved over time it was just a necessity of of people in the audience going play this song play that song and over over a 10-year period i just built up a big body of arrangements from the winger stuff and my solo stuff um and i kind of fell into it i didn't want to sing so high so i tuned my guitar down to c and i and it was real flappy and sounded terrible. So I put it through a compressor and then I cranked up the low end and then it started really having a vibe and it sounds like a giant uh, kick drum when I hit my guitar and, and uh, you know, doing voicings on the guitar, being able to do that with having, I'm, look, I wasn't a great classical guitar player, but it does give you the, it, it puts in your mind that you can voice things totally differently. And uh, it just came, I just developed it over time. And I, at one point I was doing a lot of those gigs. At this point in my life, it's terrifying because I don't know what's coming out of my voice, you know. <laughs> um, sometimes I'm a, I can sing very well and sometimes it's just like, I sound like a dead chicken. So, um, but yeah, that's how that developed. I mean, it was really just a, a very pragmatic matter of fact. Well, is there a way to compartmentalize those? Um, you know, Sting put out an album a couple of years ago called My Songs, where he did, uh, not to say reinterpretations or complete ar different arrangements, but it's, he mentioned his, uh, his, the reason he did that is because a lot like you're saying, your voice changes, you live with a song, maybe 
maybe the structure could be changed just a little and it becomes evolving over time. So is there a plan to maybe uh, release those? That's funny that you asked me that because I'm 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 I just set up a, a session to do <clears throat> a recording of Cross 2024, me and my, and my percussionist doing that, but I don't have a plan to make an album of that. So I'm so replete with ideas that I don't really want to rehash old music in a new way so much. I'm kind of like the best music that I'm going to write has yet to come. Now it may not be in the genre that the fans that have come to know me through rock music want, but as an artist, I feel like it's really incumbent on me to just do what is calling me the most. So like I said earlier, it's kind of painful if I'm not working on, you know, this giant goal of mine to have a big body of orchestral work. So if I'm like in the studio working on older songs and new arrangements, like I'm not getting off on that at all. You know, okay. I'm, Even I mean, with the 12 I, string, I mean, it, it would be a different experience for people who don't see your solo shows, but. Uh, it would be. I mean, I've been doing that for 15 years. I mean, some people that know me have seen my solo acoustic show and see exactly that. So it's too bad that I never recorded any of them. And that's bad on me. You know, shame on me for that. Um, maybe I, you know, like I say, I'm doing one of them um, on Sunday, but. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll consider that. I'll consider it. <laughs> I appreciate you liking it. Well, um, you mentioned on several occasions that uh, things that are perceived as genius are more likely the result of a mistake, you know, happy accident. So in your mind, your experience, what has been one or two things that like, I know you love it, but it was this reason or that reason. And does that uh, find itself manifesting still uh, in um, your classical compositions, little happy accidents and mistakes as well that turn into genius and gold? It's always that for me. It's never what I sit down and try to do. That's why I, that's why I continue to preach that gospel. It's like, I don't care who you are as an artist. You can try to take credit for the best stuff you've done, but I guarantee you that stuff just hits. Watch Get Back. I mean, get, or get the Beatles thing that... Uh, the big long documentary that they just put out where he's writing get back i mean it just kind of it's just like whoa man get back it just kind of comes in and you know there it is you know he could sit and try to do that all he wants but that's just that moment when it comes in it's always an accident man. like um i just thought out of the blue like screw the electric guitar let's put a harmonica on uh down incognito you know it was just like a weird idea you know um, I can't think of any exact examples right now, but, um, there's an exam when you hear if, if, and when you hear the second movement to my violin concerto, um, I was wondering what to do. This happened to me twice in the violin concerto lately. I was wondering what to do. And I had this rhythm thing and I thought, ah, just whatever. And I think, okay, well, what about this? I'll just start on C and see where it goes. And I just started playing it. And it was exactly, I mean, exactly what you hear in the thing was the first thing I played. And I was like, oh my God, well now I, and then I was like, oh my God, I need a, a, a tenor trombone right there. And I, next thing I think was exactly the thing I played. And it was, it, that moment in my life was the, was the longest moment of catching the, you know, holding on to the thing, like, whoa, this is amazing. And I was playing, and I played about five counterpart, counterpoint parts, and it was a, and it was a period, duration of about 30 seconds. And it was like one, two, three, four, five. And they all worked exactly ex as you hear them verbatim in the composition. And that was like, I can't take credit for that because I was just sitting there holding on like, oh, my God, this isn't. Yes, 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 yes. My mind was like, yes, oh, my God. And it was like every single note was exactly right. You know, um, there is nothing like that feeling, nothing like that feeling. Same thing happened in the in the uh, in the first movement, the end of the first movement. I was like, I didn't know what to do. And I just. Said, all right, well, just whatever. I'm just going to do this. And it was like, oh, my God. Yes, 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 yes. Boom. Done. 
you know, and other times you'll work months and months and months and months and months trying, you know, slogging it out, trying to make something work. You got it up on the operating table, scalpels, and it's all bleh. But then when you grab that thing and it hits you, boom, and it's never you. It's never you. It's always that thing. You sure it wasn't the grapefruits? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Give me a grapefruit and a bran muffin. Yeah. That's a funny inside joke. That's you gotta hear Red Beach tell that story. You know, he does a great uh rendition of my monotone Colorado voice. He makes you sound like you were the inspiration for Hank Hill in a way. So did, did were you approach <laughs> were you approached by Mike Judge? No, no, never. I mean I had one interaction with Mike Judge about ten years ago and that's it. So, Kip, uh, I, I've heard you say, and I'm kind of paraphrasing here, that you, you've you never really been interested in being a great instrumentalist, but it's always been about really the conversation we've had today about songwriting, about comp composition. Um, but then thinking about your time with Winger, right, like there's, as Mark alluded to at the beginning, there's there's that aspect of you have to still be a showman, right, because you're, you're fronting the band, you're playing bass, you're singing. Probably 90% of the audience is looking at you most of the show. I mean, for uh, outside of maybe when there's a solo or, you know, some other moment. So I guess the question is like, did you always want to be a front man? Was that something that you aspired to or was, and it, was it something that did it, did it come to you naturally or was there a learning curve to be able to combine vocal talents, instrumental talents, and then be able to, to pull all that off and then also entertain the crowd at the same time? All of the above. I, I did, I did, you know, I kind of wanted to be like Paul Stanley or Dave, you know, David Lee. I mean, Paul Stanley, really, you know, he was the guy. I was like, whoa, this guy's great, you know, but I, musically, I was more into the prog stuff. So it was like, you know, I loved the glam of being a, of that rock star thing. Um, when I was a kid, I, when I was really young, my parents were musicians. My mom would try to help me learn the bass parts off the record. And then when I was a kid with my brothers, I'd try to sing and play. And I was like in tears, like, I can't do it, you know. And, uh, and, and winger music is exceedingly difficult to play and sing. It's really, really hard. So once I learned how to practice, you know, you, you, any good musician will tell you, you know, slow it down half speed and then slow that down even more and start there and that's what I had to do to learn how to play this stuff you know for one thing and then you know yeah I was a ham when I was a kid I wanted to do that thing and and it did come very naturally to me I never I would never ever had to work I mean okay I had a little stage fright when I was eight years old but I've been on I've been on stage since I was eight years old in many different capacities by the way I you in know a, in, a, in a rock band and I did one semester at University of Denver of acting. I did ballet. I, I performed solos in a ballet company when I was, you know, 19. Um, I did a couple musicals in college. I was never really in college. I did a semester at DU. I did, uh, you know, I experienced the musical thing. And, and so being on stage, I'm very comfortable with it. It's no, not a problem at all. Even when I know my voice sucks, I'm like, I'm fine with it. Um, so, you know, it's, it, it's a lifetime of, 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 you know, kind of experience in that. And I also wasn't alone, you know, which is also a huge thing. I was never like a solo artist alone. I had my brothers with me. We were like a gang of wolves, you know, and you know, we, I had, we, I had a really great support system and in my band with winger, we're all really good friends to this day. And so, you know, we all, and, you know, Paul and I met in Alice Cooper and I, I hung out with Alice and learned even more from him, you know, so, um, you know, I, I'm, ex I'm very experienced on, on a lot of level at a high level. I don't think of myself and to be honest with you, I tell this to a lot of people like I don't feel like I ever made it anywhere. Um, but I have a lot of really high level experience that I'm very grateful for. So when I walk on stage, it's like, yeah, let's see what's going to happen tonight, you know. Um, but I had to really work to get to the place where I could sing and play all this stuff because it's very, very difficult, especially singing it, you know. 
but but and the last qu- last point to your question was no when Reb and I put this band together, I was like, who's going to sing this? Are you going to be the singer or am I going to be the singer? Because when I was in a band with my brothers, it was like, you know, Fletcher would sing one, Paul would sing one, Nate would sing one, I would sing one, then we'd all do one together. And, you know, um, so it was never, I mean, it, when I saw Kiss, I was like, I want to be like that. But it was, I, that was not my experience. You know, I had, to, I had to grow the skill as a front man. Paul wrote Miles Away which uh, was from his girlfriend's perspective. Um, and I think that that's a great entry point to um, songs that uh, have a personal touch. So are, are there are there songs that you've written that have a story behind them that are really emotional, stuff that, you know, things that um, fans might not know about? Everything I've written is from a totally personal perspective. I mean, I draw upon my life and other people that I've known as lives. I tend not to get into the weeds about what exactly is verbatim in my life because that's a little bit too, you know, invasive because there's, there's, there are people out there that, I mean, you want to talk about connecting the dots in the wrong way. Oh my God. So I try not to, to uh, talk too much about where all the lyrics come from, but mostly they're all from personal experience or from people around me that are close personal, you know, uh, experiences that I find are universal s- ideas that everybody can relate to. You know? There's such great lyrics in in Witness. I almost feel that um, I can imagine somebody using them as their wedding vows. And then in uh, Get Jack, there's a very simple line. It's so brilliant. It says, the, the less I'm told, the more I wonder. And so as you're coming up with these or working with other um, other artists, do you ever just look down at the paper and go, damn, this guy's good. Like, <laughs> what, what impresses you beyond the, like, you know, riding the lightning and having the inspiration? Are there times where you just, you're surprised by your own um, uh, output? Yeah, but it's fleeting. I'll be like, oh my God, this is fucking genius. And then I'll be like, okay, I hate myself again. What's next? You know, it's, it's uh and i think most artists will tell you that you know you ride the high of the bullseyes and they and they're and then you know the second they they fade it's like this thing that you're going through and you know if you can nail those ideas it really it's like a it's like a greyhound following the rabbit you know you just keep wanting to feel that because it's, there's nothing like that feeling of nailing it um i i think there's some really good i'm very very proud of certain songs like um i can't think of the name right now hold on a second um well tears of blood all comes back around uh midnight driver uh, um not what's the song on um well midnight driver of a love machine is the only song i ever felt like a rock star on when i play it live you know i didn't write those words but um Headed for Heartbreak, it continues to be a song that I'm really proud of. Um, you're talking about the one you were yeah, you were asking me specifically about stuff I've written, right? Correct. But yeah. you know, but maybe a bigger thing because I know that you you co-wrote uh, Get Jack with um, with it, I forget the artist's name, but um, not everything was all all your penmanship. So uh, you know, part of being a collaborative effort means that everybody shares in it. But either whether it's you solely or as a group, like. Where did this come from? I don't know, but it's awesome. Yeah, I mean, Damien wrote some incredible words for that that um, Get Jack, and some of my best music is on Get Jack. And so I do go back from time to time and listen to that and go, basically what it is is that I don't know how the hell I did it. <laughs> I mean, I'm one of these guys that wrote – if I dig into any of my compositions, especially the classical ones or anything off Get Jack, I can't remember how I did it. And you know what? I, when you guys um, reached out to me, I went on your site and I listened to some interviews. And, and Joby Talbot, who's a friend of mine, fantastic composer, um, he all he does most of the work for Christopher Weald, and that's how I know him. And I think I heard him say, like, I, I dig into this and I don't remember what I did, you know, and, it, and I'm like totally relate to that, you know, because you you get into it, you kind of put yourself into a trance and and then 
you come up with this thing because you're channeling this thing and then you know you sometimes you do look at it and go yeah, that's incredible you know you know um, and I know those moments for sure. I try not to boast about them because I feel like this could all go away like that, you know. Well, we have time for one more question, so I'm going to throw it to you to answer. You got two choices. Um, you asked Steve Vai once if he sees the music or hears it, which is a great question, so I'm going to steal it. That's question one. Or two, why don't you tell us Kip Winger's 10 favorite things? 10 favorite things? Could could be anything. Could be oh. a bowling alley. Could be a new well. I, I can. Shoes. I I don't think I could come up with ten because anybody that knows me knows that I'm like the Archie Bunker of rock. <laughs> like you know, I'm a very sad dude, man. Um, uh, you could take the Steve Vai out. Do you well, see I mean, I, you know, I try to answer both of them. You can always edit it, but I mean, as far as Steve Vai goes. I asked him that because I see the music. I see it, you know. I see a shape, and then I hear what that shape could sound like, you know. And I see it really clearly. I mean, now now that I've become more literate, I see I can see it kind of on the score as well, and I can even somewhat get to the point where I know what I'm hearing, which is, you know, if you were on Beethoven level when he was blind, when he was deaf. You know, I mean, these guys were really hearing, you know, verbatim Mozart and all of that. What I would say, though, is that nowadays we don't use harm harmonically. Now, I have to be very careful how I say this, because I revere Beethoven and Mozart, even though in the Steve Vai interview, I talked about how I couldn't relate to that music so much. And it's true on one level, but from a composition point, I, I revere them just to get that for the record. But the but the har the harmony is much more simple as to what's going on now. So to hear something that would be relevant in 2024 harmonically is way more complex than what what was going on back then. So <clears throat> manifesting these weird shapes and stuff for me is much more difficult than if you were just hearing like diatonic music, you know. Um, but the answer is I specifically asked Steve Vai that question because that's that's how it is for me. Now, as far as 10 things, my 10 favorite things, going to Starbucks for an oat milk latte every morning and I just sit and veg for about an hour. I mean, I, I, I live for that now, but it's a new thing. It's a new thing. It's like the last eight months. I'll wake up and go. I'll go to Starbucks, and I live in Nashville downtown, right? I go to Starbucks, and then I go to the homeless park, and I sit there with the homeless people and have my coffee, and they throw every one of them a couple bucks every now and then, and then I'll go back and go to work. I I I love to sit down when I get to sit down at my rig, pull up my stuff and start working i mean that's just i really love that i love to travel when i'm not touring um and find you know cool places to see great restaurants and stuff like that i don't love traveling when i am performing it's really getting to me um so that's not that's just as an aside to your question that's three things let me see if i can come up with a fourth i love going to the gym I'm 63, thriving on uh, staying in shape, and uh, um, man, I can only come up with four things. Uh, if you give me, <laughs> I like words, talking to you guys. We'll get, oh yeah, well that's five, and we'll let, we'll catch you on the next uh, next interview. We get the other five. But uh, Mr. Winger, from the bottom of our hearts, thank you for your time. Thank you for your energy. Thank you for Battle Stations, which was my personal entry point uh, uh, to the band. Steve Vai, Winger, Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey soundtrack, 12-year-old me listening to it. I was like, what am I hearing? Wow. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, Gene Simmons, Gene Simmons called me after we did that track, and he goes, that is how your band should sound. <laughs> and, and he was right. Too. Yeah, they're on a God Gave Rock and Roll deal on that one, too. Well, he was right, because there was a very raw element to that, but it was Finnish sounding. It was, like, very raw. Reb and I wrote that track in about three days, 
we went and recorded it in one day and it was like you know we were really on fire at that point and it was really like yeah i wish my second record could have all sounded like that you know but the second record you know i always i had a lot of trouble in the beginning back in the day when you would make a demo and then record the album and it was always like can we beat the demo you know um, and that's why nowadays I never make demos. I just, I, when Reb and I are writing, I record him the second he comes up with the riff because it's like that's the second that the energy's coming down. You can never recreate it. Well, you save that energy for Lava Cantina tonight. Winger playing July 31st. Get tickets, be there, beware. And Mr. Winger, we will catch you next time. Thanks, you guys. Appreciate uh, th all your time and thanks for having me.